please. All right, so I'm going to introduce uh, your moderator for today, Reshma Kilnani. So Reshma's got an amazing background. She's a software engineer. She's worked at Facebook. She's worked at Microsoft. She's gone through YC. She got her BS and MS, or in her MEng from MIT. And she's currently at Box, working on bringing viewing and rendering for medical data formats to the Box platform. So that's things like x-rays and pathology reports. And she's got a great story there, because the reason she's at Box now is her company that she co-founded, uh, MedXT, was acquired by Box in fall of 2014. In the hallway, she said she's a recovering founder, so I'm sure she's got a really great story there, and she'll, uh, she'll take that to you guys now, so welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone, and welcome. We have a great lineup of founders for you here today. Um, and I realize it's like the afternoon, so we'll like try and keep the engagement level high. And a friendly reminder, we do have a chance for you to ask questions of the founders in the uh, app. So please go ahead and do that. Think of the hardest questions you can think of. Um, <laughs> yeah, go for it. But we have a great lineup. Um, Troy is a founder of Picnic Health and um, healthcare company. So dear to my own heart, we have Nikunj here from um, Falconry. Uh, Amo goes by Mo from Boomerang and Oliver from Vig Viglink. And so if I could ask all of you guys to maybe say a little bit about yourself and about your company and uh, how you got into it. Start with you, Troy. Thanks, Reshma. And actually, we've uh, used Reshma's product that now is part of Box, and we continue to use it, and it's a fantastic tool. Um, so I'm Troy. I was MIT 8 and 16. Um, and Picnic Health, what we do is we help patients deal with medical records. So when someone signs up, we collect all of their records for them, we structure and digitize the information, and we turn it into a uh, health timeline that can get shared amongst their doctors. Um, yeah, and we do that. We work with pharma and biotech companies as well. They sponsor accounts for uh, people who volunteer in studies, and then we give them a data set that lets them do cutting edge research with. This is actually pretty cool. It, it looks like Facebook timeline, but for your medical records. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Nikunj, take it away. Tell us about what yeah. you do. Um, so in many ways, we are disrupting the industrial internet, being a small little company that's democratized the means of understanding and interpreting industrial data and putting it into the hands of people who are already inside that plant, rather than spending it all on contracts with some of the biggest companies who would truck in their consultants. Uh, and we are doing that uh, to help these production operations improve their top lines in terms of production goals, quality goals, uptime goals, and create hundreds of billions of dollars in value over the next 10 years across industries. Um, our core competency is in the ability to understand multivariate uh, time series data. So, so I think the name is very inspirational. Falconry, like with sharp eyes, can see what's going on anyway. <laughs> so, Mo, tell us about uh, your company. Um, yeah, so Boomerang is the most popular productivity solution for email platforms like Gmail and Outlook. So we were the you know, platform partners for Outlook when they came up with the Outlook API for their partners. We have millions of users using email more effectively with artificial intelligence. So right now, we added the first ever real-time AI assistance to help you write better emails. And the way we do that is to analyze what you're writing as you're writing and tells you the probability that you will get a response by measuring different factors. And these factors are, some of them are simple factors that you just measure, and some of them are actually backed by uh, deep learning analysis on what you are writing. And the main thing is we gave you that feedback as you're writing so you're not just getting a static report after you already sent it so you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And we actually give you actionable advice on what's going to impact the most. And that's what we do. That's great. Lots of MITers in the crowd. We're going to need help with our writing. Yes. <laughs> All right, Oliver, your turn. Uh, so I'm the founder CEO of Viglink. 
Uh, Vigling is a content-driven commerce company. What that means is the the publishing industry uh, has relied on display advertising for a long time. Uh, you know that is really collapsing, and the the publishers have come to the realization that a lot of their content is really commercially driven, uh, fashion or automotive or you know entertainment. You're really talking about products, encouraging your audience to buy products. So Viglink has a suite of technologies that encourage your audience to buy the items you're talking about and uh, you know pay commissions to to the authors when that happens. And so we run a two-sided marketplace of advertisers and publishers. We run auctions. Uh, you know, to try to maximize the value that the publisher can drive, and and we really enable a new revenue source for publishers that's independent and additive to display advertising. Awesome. So we're talking about journey today. So perhaps we could uh, dig back of you know into the past. Mo, maybe you could tell us about you come from Burma. How did you make your journey through to becoming a founder where you are today? Um, yeah. So I didn't know what MIT was until three months before I got into MIT. Uh, I grew up in Burma. It was a completely closed down country under a military regime. We didn't have internet. I didn't have an email address. So I literally sent in a pack of paper to MIT and got acceptance surprisingly on Pi Day. It was amazing how they <laughs> like, co like orchestrated your acceptance letters to arrive to Burma on the same day that every other American students did. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, when I got into MIT, of course, by that time I realized what MIT was. <laughs> and <laughs> took my first ever flight, not just out of the country, ever. And got to MIT, studied computer science, briefly considered being an economics, and then I realized I just didn't have the mentality to, with uncertainty. And after graduating from MIT, I work on like just big companies as an engineer and then switch into UX design, then went into more of the product and product design. And I think my journey is like kind of strange. It's, Background-wise, I always knew like what it means to start a business because my family's always like my mother and my grandmother both started their own businesses and run them. So I never really knew what it's like to be a salary employee. Like both my parents ran their business together. But when I graduated from MIT, there wasn't really a way for an international student to start a business. There wasn't an easy visa category. And so I went to bigger, you know, established companies that can support visa sponsorship. Then I kept going to smaller and smaller companies without realizing that's what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then realizing that, hey, you know, I was a productivity geek. I was always hacking around with my inbox calendar, trying out different tools, and realizing that nobody was building what I needed. So that's how I came to, <laughs> to start my own company. Amazing. No email to natural language entrepreneur email expert. <laughs> Incredible journey. Okay, Troy, your turn. So, I mean, you studied at MIT. I'm, I have a lot of school spirit, by the way, if you can't tell. Um, so, you can pretty much do anything. What made you go into healthcare? Well, my parents were actually both doctors, and I had like, worked in their offices um, as a kid, I was kind of traumatized by rows of filing cabinets when I would have to, I scribe, but have to pull charts out. And I was like, did not really see a, um, a path at the time to healthcare getting fixed. Um, but around the end of school, there was this big push towards digitizing health data. Um, and there were a lot of EMRs were being created, a lot of money getting thrown at uh, making EMRs, but it didn't seem to be being done well. A lot of doctors, pretty much talk to any doctor and they'll complain about their EMR. Maybe it's not 100% true, but it's pretty close. And uh, <laughs> it never really created data sets that would like let you, as a patient, like understand what was going on or like doing research or analysis, like do anything. So I thought there had to be some better way to improve um, how data is used in healthcare. 
And I met my co-founder, who's, her story kind of ties directly to what we do um, at Picnic Health. She has a chronic disease and was seeing multiple specialists all in different health systems and found that to actually make sure that her care was getting delivered as it needed to be, she would have to like go to each office, get records printed out or faxed to her, create a binder, lug it between all of her appointments, and then like tell her doctor, oh, well this is what my gastroenterologist was doing, and tell her that to her PCP. And there's just this huge overhead that falls on a patient to move their data around. So that's what we uh, set out to fix. I mean, that's definitely true. Healthcare has a lot of faxing to this day, so it's uh, good times for all. So um, continuing on the school spirit theme, um, Nick Quintier is our diverse candidate on our panel as he does not have an MIT degree. So <laughs> I'm going to structure this as a quiz. Succinctly, I want you to describe a real-world application of Falconry's technology, and then I want you to tell me about the biggest challenge in your field. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, a lot of us are curious about, uh, for example, our physical activity, and have often heard about pe people building wearable sensor technology and collecting data from our movement. Um, it is actually very straightforward using falconry to classify at every moment of time what you are doing. And it can differentiate between, for example, rowing and cycling, which in some ways are similar. You're sitting down. Um, you could differentiate between, say, for example, sitting and cycling, again, which appear similar in some ways. And we don't realize that certain perceptive tasks that are very easy for people to perform are very hard for computers to do. And this has been one of the reasons why um, computers are still not very effective at dealing with time series data. It's an arcane area. There's not a lot written about it. If you go search on Google, all you'll find is scientific papers. There are no open source libraries or projects and things like that. Um, but it turns out that in order to do anything substantial about the industrial internet, about IoT, you need to actually be able to understand nonlinear behaviors that are recorded in time series data. And what appears to be a very easy thing for us to do, which is look at a picture and try to understand what the data is doing in it, which is not actually as easy as it might appear at first. Um, I had realized when I was working at my previous company that is a very hard task to do, and most people cannot do it well, and most companies who depend on the data and what is going on in those systems make it a part of cost of doing business to deal with everything that goes wrong that they cannot understand from their data. And so there was a substantial amount of inefficiency. Um, and that's why um, I decided to start Falcon. I mean, there are several other such examples that relate to our day-to-day -day life, even including things like distracted drivers. Can you tell? And the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is um, I'm talking about an industry that is 40% of global economy. It covers all forms of manufacturing, transportation, power, energy. And so it's a massive industry. There's no way that you can penetrate a massive industry as that through any simple approach. And partnerships are very important, but more importantly, these are long-term relations that you can get into. So just understanding what is the mindset of the buyer and being prepared for their questions like, how are you going to be around? Why should I trust you? It required a lot of thinking uh, uh, even before I started the company. I needed to get into the right frame of mind. And I think that it still remains difficult to this day, even though now we are partnering with Zeta Ventures um, to convince them about our long-term long future. But I think that people have realized that companies that do well will be around one way or the other. I mean, 40% of the economy is pretty enormous and daunting. I would agree with that, but that's, that's great. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're talking about AI today, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, and Oliver, this question is for you. Tell me about the applications of AI within your company, and how do you think about the problem space? Sure. Uh, the most uh, obvious application is we uh, insert new links in text, uh, and that has to be done in a way that a reader feels like a human being might have done. So we actually read the text. We're really focused on English at this point. 
Uh, and, and we want to be able to underline things that a human being might have underlined and link them somewhere sensible. And that's a lot harder than it sounds, right? I think the, you know, the classic, I linked to Amazon uh, the store when the article was talking about Amazon the river, uh, you know, that, that is a great example of, of the pretty nuanced um, understanding that humans have of text that, that you know, machines traditionally have not. So we do a lot of pretty deep NLP work uh, you know, to, to understand, uh, we call it commercial reference extraction, meaning uh, mentions of products in text. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a feedback loop, and, and uh, it's not just machine learning. There's real sort of uh, models in there. Uh, we also uh, use machine learning techniques around, you know, we get product, we, we analyze about 600 million product offers every day from, you know, uh, advertisers all around the world. And to look at one uh, product and another and say, you know, these are the same product, that's also a pretty subtle problem. Uh, you know, if, uh, if the image is the same and the price is very different, you know, maybe it's not the same product, but maybe it is, right? They're, they're, you know, titles are never the same. So really trying to, to look at noisy textual product catalog data and resolve it down to, you know, these are the, quote, same uh, and, and sometimes it's not even clear what the human should say, like the, the blue version and the black version, are, this, are those the same or not? Um, those are two great applications of AI and NLP uh, and machine learning that we use. And like from a spectrum of um, we know nothing to Jarvis, like where are we? <laughs> Pretty close to we know nothing, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think... Well, part, part of the thing with AI, um, actually one of my colleagues who's not here, uh, who is a classmate at MIT, she wrote a thesis the year we graduated, said, if, it's wor if it works, it's not AI. That was, that was the title. <laughs> um, and, and I think to some extent that's still true today, right? The line of what we think, uh, you know, we can get done keeps moving dramatically. I mean, it, you know, it, it does seem like speech recognition, for example, was totally unsolved 10 years ago and is basically solved today. Uh, but... Certainly when it comes to reading text and understanding what it's really saying, we're nowhere. That's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is actually a dual question for the two of you, and maybe Troy, I'll let you answer first. But like the conventional wisdom is that big companies like Google, Amazon, are gonna have the resources and like, um, you know, both in human capital and training data in order to solve these machine learning and AI problems. What unique advantages do you see startups having? Like, why would you compete head-to-head -head with the behemoth? Great question. Um, I would say, as a startup, there are kind of three different ways that you could try to differentiate, take an approach that, like, one of the big companies couldn't take. Uh, you could take an existing data set and try to, or a data set a lot of people have access to, and try to apply it in a product in some novel way. Um, you could try to come up with novel models for um, doing, doing learning, and if you take that from like academic work or something like that. Or you could try to build a data set that none of the big players actually have access to. Um, and at Picnic Health, um, we are effectively building a data set that doesn't really exist um, in other places. And where it is, like that data set is longitudinal health data for individual patients, so complete structured data over time. And the reason that like big companies wouldn't really attack this problem, and we are, is because it seems like a very scary, like unscalable process that you need to go through to build this data uh, data set. So our work mostly involves faxing records, getting records in the mail, running OCR, uh, optical character recognition, so to convert the image to text, and then analyzing the, the text and images to structure that information. And it seems something that's like, oh, you're going to go get paper records for every person in the country. Um, it sounds like kind of insane. And that's why you know, big companies won't do it. But as a startup, you can be like, you know what, I'm going to take this insane thing and figure out a way to make it not insane. And that's one approach. I guess as a founder, you have to be a little bit insane, right? Um, Fair enough. So <clears throat> that's the first principle. Second principle is if you're going to dream big, it's got to be really big. 
Um, the advantage I had, perhaps, was that the big companies in this space are G, IBM, SAP, Microsoft, to some extent, and Siemens. Um, some of them are known for software, others are known for industrial, but this was the intersection of the two. And they could have solved this problem earlier if they wanted to, but they hadn't. So that told me that they had weaknesses or perhaps blind spots. Uh, and then thirdly, um, I had always inculcated a relation with them where I could be supportive of their aspirations and help them get there faster or perhaps help them achieve some competitive success over the other. So there was always the likelihood of a symbiotic relationship with one of these big guys. At the same time, I knew that uh, if they wanted to, they could take away this piece of cake from me. Uh, but I trusted my ability to be nimble about it and get there first. Can I add? Please. Yeah, so the thing about you know data is the main thing, right? For us, yes, Google is going to have more data on email. But do they have the specific data on which emails people expect a response to? We have that, right? And that's the kind of super hyper-focused intention of the user that we have that they don't. And the other part is kind of a philosophical difference. Maybe you can call it a blind spot, but a lot of big companies in a way, maybe because they think it can be automated or, or just the way they see how artificial intelligence is strength, where it lies, they are thinking about how to replace humans, right? They're like, how can I get it so that some robot can write my email for you? And for us, it's about how can we help you, human, write better email with intelligence, your intelligence being augmented by the AI. So instead of trying to take over and replace human, being a startup, being closer to our users, where we know users are not comfortable with it and their trust is not there. So you, are you going to be there where a machine is going to answer all your emails without you ever seeing it? <laughs> Right? So we know that, and we can say, yes, this is where the startup strength is. We know our users better. We know our data better than the big guys. And also, they sometimes have blind spot or kind of like the philosophical interpretation of where the technology should be. Really interesting. OK, so this is the kind of last question um, from me. And then we have our question. So make sure to vote and put your questions, folks. But um, I'm going to start with you, Oliver. So earlier in the day, I was at a panel. And um, there were, you know, I guess VCs on the panel. And they were putting you know, companies on an AI spectrum. The spectrum was hype, hyperbole, and hysteria. So can you tell me a little bit about your company? Like, you know, how big is it? How much money have you raised? That type of thing. And then like. Where are you on the hype to hysteria um, spectrum? And how do you think about that? Sure. So uh, Viglink has been around eight years, actually. Uh, we're 35 people. Uh, we've raised about $20 million over the years. Uh, the last time we raised was three years ago. We did not intend to raise money again. Uh, I would say on, the, on that spectrum, we're at the not hype stage. Uh, it's a real business. Uh, you know, we have customers who pay us more than we spend. Um, you know, it, 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 uh, we don't measure ourselves by, um, you know, EBITDA is something we actually talk about. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, can be unusual. It certainly took longer, I think, uh, than I anticipated. Um, you know, one, one sort of piece of wisdom I think I've, I've gained over the last couple of years is that, is that convincing consumers or, or businesses to do something new is really, really hard. Um, you know, I think... We came in to, to advertise or to, excuse me, publications and said, you know, hey, you can make money from your content. And the New York Times honestly almost threw me out of their office. You know, they, like they just said, we would never do this. This is, this, you know, we're journalists. This is not what we're about. Uh, and then, uh, you know, last year they bought the wire cutter for $30 million. So, so there certainly has been a change in attitude over the last, you know, eight years. I had wanted it to be, you know, four years, but, it, you know, these things take a long time. Um, Attitudes do shift, uh, and, and training customers to do something new is really hard. I think much better if you can find something they already know they need to do and give them a solution to do it. Um, you know, I think, I think the AI hyperbole thing, um, 
a lot of people are sort of trying to shoehorn their company into we're an AI company because there's a lot of investor interest and, and media interest. Um, you know, I, I think solving problems that people need solved uh, is, is always the way to get the customer's heart and getting the customer's heart is always the long-term way to have a successful business. Guys, a bunch of myths were just busted here. There's a non-hyperbolic AI company doing natural language processing. <laughs> so take note. Can I add? We Please. are the second oldest. We were talking about company age over there. We're seven years old, again. The last time we raised was actually earlier than you, 2011. And we are profitable. We, I don't know that I have the authority to say we never intend to raise again because I'm not the CEO. <laughs> but we don't see why we should. Um, and we are also, again, like the, the part that we added AI to our product wasn't because we were like looking for, we're not a hammer looking for a nail. We put out a static analysis of our data to our user as a marketing email. And we get so many people from our users saying, why aren't you giving it to me as I write my email? So we're like, okay, our users are knocking our own door and asking us to build this, right? So that's why we build it. And adding that one feature alone has gotten, gotten us like more growth over the life of the company since we released it. Amazing. Myth-busting data point two. I think I'm seeing a huge gap between the investor community and the founder community here, guys. Okay. So we are going to move into lightning round, taking it from the... Um, from the board here. And uh, let's start out with how did you get your first five customers? We're starting with you, Troy. Well, this is my mom, my dad. <laughs> uh, seriously, we... Nepotism. Yeah, okay. exactly. That is, that is the key. Um, we went through like our personal networks to find people that actually needed um, the service we provided, uh, which was collecting <laughs> records and moving them around for them. Very ill patients? Mostly pr very ill patients. I mean, we, there was a bit of a pivot that we had at one point, um, but we actually like, found people that needed this service before we built it all out. I couldn't cheer up. Um, we mostly found our initial customers through events that we were either participating in or presenting at. Uh, we are email tools, so five, first five customer was kind of easy, you know, friends. Um, but the first 5,000 customers came from life hacker community where, you know, a lot of people are talking about productivity. So you knowing where your community is. So the first big deal I closed was uh, with MySpace, which I, I sort of got in through a, a connection. And I spent three months closing them and they went live. They were at this time, they were the seventh biggest publisher on the internet. And they made something like $5,000 a month. And my investors said like, wow, this is the worst business ever. If you sign up the entire internet, you're going to make like a million dollars a year. Let's exit the business immediately. So thankfully, we didn't do that. And we went and found some other customers who had uh, you know, content much more applicable to our technology. Uh, but, you know, the first couple were just personal sweat for me, working networks, and, and choosing the right five first customers is pretty key. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat um, in, this, um, in this room. Okay, so the next question is, and Nikunj, I'll ask you to, like, take lead on this one, um, and others can chime in later, but how did you make the transition from academia to entrepreneurship? You have your doctorate and um, were in academia for some time, or...? Yeah, I, I guess I would call myself a confused academic. I should probably not have pursued a PhD if I knew I was not going to be in academia. But I also knew that the type of advanced work I wanted to do, I needed to have an advanced degree to get better exposure to what I wanted to do. Um, fortunately for me, I was working throughout my PhD work as a full-time employee in technology. And so for me, it was an easy transition. Okay, uh, Mo, this, one, this one's going to lead with you, and if others want to uh, chime in, that would be great as well. But, um, like, how did your original concept differ from what you have today? Can you walk us through a little bit the evolution and how you made the decisions about the product and the offering? Um, the original concept, if people who are not familiar with Boomerang, is just snoozing an email, right? That was what we needed at the time. And we really let our customer guide it. So the reason we are profitable is because we have real revenue from real customers, and they drive a lot of our product roadmap. And 
Do you let the them vote, or what, what do they do? Uh, they just write in emails, right? <laughs> when you have really passionate customers, there are people who will track down our offices and barge in and tell us what they want. So it's kind of strange when you're in a consumer space, it's a little bit different. We, they find us and they kind of nag you constantly. But one thing that we have to remember is where's our true north. So our vision of the company is to make everybody more productive so that they can pursue what they intend to pursue. If you're an architect, you come to work, you want to design your masterpiece. You don't want to deal with email. You don't want to manage your to-do list. That's not the point of you waking up that day. So our vision of the company is to enable everybody to wake up every day, energize, come to work, and do what they love best. And sometimes you will get customers who will tell you, hey, if you just build this slightly unethical thing that salespeople will love, you will make 20 million more. And we're like, thank you very much. We consider it, but that's not where we want to be. I think that um, you've got to sort of differentiate between what you're trying to do and, and how that shows up in the world, right? So I think we um, sort of identified the idea that the, the hyperlink, which is the sort of defining feature of HTML, what, what makes the web different from text is that you can jump from one document to another through links. We realized that that was just technology that literally hadn't changed since the web began. The fact that you can click on a link and arrive at a 404 is crazy. Like, the upstream document should notice the downstream document went away and, like, remove the link or do something different. So our view was, hey, the, the, the links in the web have value that is not being exploited, and there's a lot of cool stuff we can do there. That hasn't changed at all. Um, how you deliver that value and stay in business as a business and what products you have, that's changed a lot. Uh, and, and it's frankly not necessarily, you know, I can go to a customer and say, I can make you, you know, 12 cents a click on your links, and if I'm really smart, 25. That's frankly not what, what motivates me as much as creating a valued commodity out of what was historically thrown away. Makes sense. Okay, one final question, and I'm going to give this to, one to you, Troy. Um, <laughs> how did you figure out your business model and which customers would actually pay for your product? That is a good question for us as well. Um, so we originally started charging consumers directly, so patients directly, to get our service. Um, and it was fairly expensive, so not that many people could necessarily pay for it. We found over time that a lot of other organizations were like asking us, oh, is there any way you could do this for this group of patients that we have. It's like we're running this study on a particular condition and we have no way to get their clinical data. Um, and we were like, no, we're gonna keep running with this like consumer stuff for now. And then eventually like we had enough of that. It was like, okay, we should pay attention. Um, and since we've done that, like our growth has been much, much better. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was basically customers. Listening listening to customers. Awesome. Well, guys, please uh, join me in thanking our illustrious panel. <laughs> <laughs>